Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Diem, a clinical psychologist specializing in transgender care. Welcome to my channel. On today's Q&A, we have some really good questions that a lot of you have asked me. Some of you have even directly emailed me your question. Thank you so much. Um, there's two uh, long questions and then the rest seem to be short. Um, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that short are not juicy. Um, it just means the long ones are where you elaborate a lot more information for me to go off of. Keep in mind, as always, Q&A is part where I answer your direct and specific questions. You're welcome to put down your questions below in the comment section of this video, or you're also welcome to um, email me directly like some of you have been doing already. Also keep in mind that if your question is specifically for me to uh, find out if you're transgender, if you actually do have gender dysphoria diagnosis, I won't be able to answer that because that is very specific and um, without knowing your history, it's just not asking for me to answer that. So as long as they're general and so far they have been general and fantastic, I'll keep answering them. So let's get started because these are some really, really creations, great questions a lot of you asking me. As always, blocked out um, your uh, usernames for privacy reasons. So the first question is, hi, Dr. Z. Uh, greetings from Sydney, Australia. Oh my God, I have the font here is so small and my eyesight is completely going to space. Um, I really appreciate your YouTube video. They're amazing. I've been learning a lot from them. Thank you so much. I'm glad that they're very helpful. My question relates to overcoming resistance. I don't really have any doubts about my gender identity. I'm a trans fan. And I've been feeling a lot better since I started hormones. I definitely want to transition socially as my old strategies for coping with dysphoria weren't working anymore, which is basically very common for a lot of people to realize that their coping uh, to cope with dysphoria no longer works. And then people decide they need to do some other things or move closer to transition in order to cope with gender dysphoria. And I was really struggling in my career and personal life. However, I'm still resisting my trans identity somewhat. I'm still male passing, unfortunately, and when people misgender me, it sucks. Yes, it does. But I don't have the confidence to establish my new identity and tell people these are my pronouns. So I just stay silent, which I hate doing. I'm looking at hair removal options, but I can't seem to bring myself to book the appointment. I know it's expensive, but facial hair is one of the biggest sources of dysphoria for me. I want to present fam. I'm not high fam, maybe casual fam. That's fine, but I am terrified of being seen as a man in women's clothing when I'm not a man, which was why I never cross dress, which is by the way, very, very common to a lot of people, especially when they start transition. A lot of people don't want, and the, a lot of you will tell me this verbally. A lot of my clients at least will tell me this exactly. They don't want to be seen as a man um, trying to pretend to be a woman because it, it feels so strongly anti uh, right against your identity because you're not a man you are women um, and so it becomes very difficult i suspect my age may have something to do with it i'm 39 as i've picked up uh, some uh, learned behaviors over the years which seem to have become ingrated so my old habits might be hard to break let me know if you have any thoughts and thanks for, for reading so great questions on resistance right so here we have an individual 39 years old um, trans femme identified um, who has come to a point in their life where um, coping no longer is working, coping is no longer helping. So as a result, this person is thinking about moving towards social transition, but still struggling uh, with a lot of aspects of resistance because uh, you're still being misgendered when you're out there. And when you get misgendered, you don't assert yourself, right? You don't advocate for your pronouns. You don't advocate for your gender identity. And um, as a result, I would assume your resistance is actually getting worse as one of the reasons why it's getting worse. You also want to start social transition. You want to start facial hair removal because facial hair gives you the most dysphoria, but it's expensive. So there's a lot of resistance, um, even in the way you write this message to me, where you indicate things you want to do. But then I notice you're using a lot of language to justify or to come up with reasons uh, why you're not going to engage in the things. Here's the thing resistance 
is always going to be there for a lot of you. And it's going to be there because you are dealing with stepping into transition, which is overwhelmingly scary, which is, if you just go on internet and learn about it, is costly, um, is emotionally straining, is frustrating, is painful, all of the things. As a result, you're going to naturally resist it because even though the benefits are so great, you're not at a point where you yet reaping the benefits of transition. In early stages, you're not going to be reaping any benefits yet. Reaping benefits comes later. And because you're not reaping any benefits, all you're seeing is detriments. Hence, the resistance. So please recognize first and foremost, it is normal and natural to have resistance. The goal is not um, how to eradicate resistance. But the goal is this. Recognize how what you already have done in the past did not work for you. You came to realization that your coping skills are not working. Michelle, I'm glad you came to that realization because coping skills are not meant to be there long term. Now, what I really suggest for, for this individual to do is if you can financially afford even a short period of time laser hair removal, that can tremendously help you. Why? Because one, you hair, like you say here in the email, it already is the biggest source of videos for you. So whether you're going to decide to move forward with any other transition related services, surgeries or anything else, if you remove your hair, which is permanent, it's still going to help you because it sounds like the hair is still a big scope of the problem for you. So I'd really recommend, especially if you have dark hair follicles and money is an issue, Starting with laser is a great idea. And then moving into electrolysis when you have um, difficult to remove hair, or you have resistant hair, you have white hair follicles. But if you have dark hair, laser can be way, way, way uh, cheaper in order to help you remove hair. Um, and it can be really, really helpful. So I really recommend, if you can, start moving into some forms of social aspects of transition. Also, when you get misgendered, is it possible for you to assert yourself and to assert your pronouns? The more you assert yourself in your pronouns, the more you step into accepting part of your inner self, and the more it's going to be easier for you, you're going to feel more confident and less resistant. Another thing that I noticed is that you mentioned that you identify as femme, but you're not really high femme, which is high femme usually is known as um, like hyper feminine. Uh, hyper-feminine clothing, dresses and skirts, um, makeup. Um, one can say that the way I look potentially could be considered hyper-femme. But you identify more as a casual femme. So casual femme uh, is oftentimes uh, jeans and t-shirt, leggings and sweater, a more casual type of, a lot of times borderline adronages type of clothing too. Because especially you identify as a casual femme and because you have such a fear of being seen as a man, dressed as a woman or men pretending to be a woman, which is very common for a lot of you, I would recommend for you to slowly move more and more into a drunkish closing presentation. And that will not only help you, um, help you kind of negate the sphere you have of being perceived as a man who dressed as a woman, but it's also going to help you tremendously with your dysphoria because this is part of social transition being able to present more adrangiously. For a lot of you out there, the spirit, the spirit in transition, where you are still evolving into yourself, uh, a lot of times through the help and aid of hormones, and it is that period where you're still finding yourself and finding your, your style, your feminine style, your feminine aesthetic. Uh, perhaps you're waiting for your hair to grow out. This is the period that is inevitable for a lot of you and that's a period where passing if that matters to you is going to be more challenging and this is exactly the period where you should be more adrenalinous where you should be pushing the envelope slowly gain confidence push it again um, that's usually the steps that best work in this case so hopefully that helps you answer that question. Great question. Remember, resistance is going to be there. Uh, since your hair causes you the most dysphoria, I really encourage for you to try to figure a way to deal with it and try to assert yourself. Now, your last comment here, you're 39 and you're wondering if age has anything to do with it. No. Um, 
not necessarily, I won't say exactly no, but not necessarily 39 is young. I've seen people who's in their 60s and 70s and 80s that have ingrained type of behavior that they have a hard time eradicating. Um, it's really all about just adaptability. We as human beings are very quick to adapt. We just need some more time and we need the repetition within those things in order to modify and change our behavior. So I don't think your age necessarily has anything to do with it. Um, I think you're very young. Um, I think you have so much potential. So don't don't give up on yourself. Just take little steps, even little things, changing one thing in your wardrobe, even going from wearing men's t-shirts to female uh, women's t-shirts can help you tremendously. So little steps can go miles away. That's what I really recommend. But resistance is going to be there and just find a way to walk forward with resistance. Great question. So next question. Um, hi, Dr. C. Thank you for this series. Such a good and helpful idea. Oh, I'm so glad, by the way, that a lot of you are enjoying this series uh, because I enjoy making them very much so. So it's, it's like a win-win for me. I win and you win. Um, I have a ton of questions, but I will try to stick to one about coping with dysphoria. Usually I use music to work through feelings. Great way, by the way, to deal with feelings, with dysphoria, music, poetry, uh, really good film. Any one of those creative arts is really great too. Both good and bad, powerful female vocalists in rock and roll give me the whole spectrum of feelings. Except one, dysphoria. It can temporarily distract me, but as soon as I stop, the dysphoria is back. I feel helpless when it comes to this part of me. I started hormones, not T blockers, only estrogen as it's private, all I can afford, seven months ago, which helps me a lot in a lot of areas. In other areas, it just gets worse and worse. I've tried makeup, wigs, and clothes from the women's department, but all it does is show me all the things I don't have. And then I feel worse than before. Do you have any tips or exercises you have found work? I can add that I'm waiting for my healthcare provider, but that wait um, to first visit is 27 months. I, I'm so sorry. Some counters just have such negligent and uh, non-existent uh, trends of affirming care. I really, my heart goes out to you. And getting longer every day after that, it's at least one year before I can expect any concrete help. Whew. So this is about coping, right? You're saying you have quite a bit of dysphoria. You're struggling. You're using music to help you, and it helps. But the minute you stop listening to music, your dysphoria is back. Um, you have also started hormones. You're not on blockers, but you are on estrogen. You've been seven months on hormones. Um, and sometimes it helps, and sometimes you just feel worse. You also tried um, makeup, wigs, clothes in women's department. So you tried feminizing aspects of things. And all it do is just showing you what you don't have. And it's, as a result, I can understand you will feel more dysphoria. Um, so how to deal with all of this? What can you do? especially when you're waiting 27 months to see a provider, what can you do in the meantime? For starters, I got to say, you're already doing a lot of wonderful things. Even if music helps you temporarily, that's still a great and healthy way to cope with dysphoria. So keep listening to the music. Now I know you can't listen to music all the time. And when you stop listening to music, the dysphoria is back. And yes, the dysphoria will be back unless the mind is preoccupied. That's why when we are preoccupying our mind with something else, people, for example, throw themselves into work and become workaholics, dysphoria tends to subside. So um, see what else can you introduce in order to help you cope with dysphoria. Some of the other positive things. Look for uh, podcasts, look for interviews, look for the content that is positive and uplifting, even if it doesn't have anything to do with gender, even if it's content such as how to think positive thoughts, um, how to uh, be more happy and joyful in your life, how to be more present in the now, how not to dwell from the past, how to be more optimistic versus pessimistic. All of this content is called self-development. I, for the record, even though I am a psychologist, let me tell you, every single month I go on Amazon and I pick up at least two to three texts on self-development. Uh, this month, I just read a book from, if you follow me on Instagram, from um, Gap to Gain, which all has to do in being in the now and seeing what you achieved versus striving for your ide idealized uh, goal in your life. 
So self-development is vital to all of us. We need self-development and we're not taught self-development skills in school or colleges or in life. Sure, life examples give us self-development tools, but you can learn so much from amazing writers out there, both spiritual and uh, both who, who non-spiritual writers. It's just there's a wealth of information. So listen to their podcast. There's a lot of great individuals just top of the my head, Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, great officer, great podcaster. And I think she has a podcast. Um, oh, I've been listening to a lot of Oprah guests uh, lately and TikTok. Her positive messages are phenomenal. So surround yourself in other ways with other positive voices when you can't necessarily always listen to music. Now, hormones will take care of this body and sometimes can also elevate this body at the same time. Why? Because when you go on hormones, you're starting to have other physical changes. You're starting to have a softening of your skin. Maybe you're starting to see other physical outward changes. And all of those changes for somebody like you who's still waiting for healthcare is going to feel like um, everything that you want, but not everything that you have yet. Just what you felt when you went for um, shopping and you feminized, when you looked at yourself, all, all you saw is everything that you don't have. I really encourage you, really encourage you to work on your mindset and really encourage you to not look at it as everything you don't have, but look at it as everything you have yet to gain, everything you're actually going to work toward for. So when you look at yourself, this is what you're going for. Transition is a process and it takes a while. Um, and changing your mindset from what I don't have to what I'm going to gain is also part of the transition. So I really encourage for you to um, surround yourself with, and I'm not talking about toxic, I'm not talking about like this fluffy, uh, you know, BS by the TV, you all think positive thoughts and everything is going to be fine. No. Thinking about genuinely working on your mindset, wake up in the morning and sh shift your perspective, recognize that you woke up today and you are alive. And uh, yes, you have to deal with gender dysphoria, but you are alive and you have all of those tools in front of you to try to help you combat dysphoria. So again, I, I can't stress enough how important it is to start a few morning waking up. You click on a podcast, so you clip a YouTube video of somebody who is positive and transformational and talks about uplifting mood or how to be in the now. And for the whole day, you it's almost as if you are priming your brain to think in a particular way for the rest of the day. So really encourage for you to utilize those tools of podcasters and positive voices and all the people out there to help you uh, get through the things and you will get through the things hanging there. I know the 27 months for healthcare is crazy. Um, but you will get there. But great question. Um, and people who are listening to this uh, video today, if you have better coping skills, so we have other things I have not mentioned, comment below, let this person know what some of the coping things that help you to. Another thing that comes to mind immediately is uh, support groups. Support groups are phenomenal, even online support groups or little private Facebook groups where you can find your community, where you can talk to people. Those things are there for you. So make sure you utilize them. So great question. Next question. Hi, Dr. Z. Would you like some, would like some tips for dealing with imposter syndrome? Um, I actually made a video on imposter syndrome. I'm going to link it below for you to take a look at. Um, imposter syndrome is first and foremost really important for everybody to recognize that everybody has imposter syndrome. Everybody. For you, it just so happens that you have imposter syndrome in regards to gender. For everybody else, they will have imposter syndrome in terms of a lot of other things. Um, Maya Angela once said that she continued to battle with imposter syndrome every time she wrote a book, feeling that they're going to discover that she's a fraud and she's not a good author. I mean, talk about her. I mean, she's a phenomenal, phenomenal writer. So recognize that everybody has imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is something that's very, very common. Usually when people really struggle with imposter syndrome in tradition, there are two primary things that really cause increase or um well, increase in imposter syndrome for individuals who are transgender. One of the things that will cause increase in imposter syndrome is challenges or struggles accepting your gender identity. When you resist and you don't want to accept or acknowledge that you're transgender, that's when the imposter syndrome is going to bubble up because you're creating a split and friction within yourself between who you actually are and who you're telling yourself you're not. Another second main reason why people have imposter syndrome, apart from that, is when they have not socially immersed themselves enough. What do I mean by that? Um, 
social immersion is whether in the beginning of transition um, and especially throughout transition and especially at the end of transition, how often have you socially immersed yourself and your life in your authentic gender? Simple way to put, how long have you been living in your authentic gender? The longer people have been living in their authentic gender and uh, presenting as themselves, the less they will feel imposter syndrome. In the beginning stages of transition, it's very common to have a lot of imposter syndrome and then for that to taper off again based on how well you can accept yourself and as well as how often do you immerse yourself socially. So um, think about what I said. Ask yourself um, uh, whether you've been socially living as your true self for a long time and at what extent have you really accepted yourself and um, you'll get at the root of what your imposter syndrome is at great question so next question is hi dr z thank you for everything you do you're very welcome it's it's, it's really uh, the, the, i don't even have words it's so humbling just to pass on information I, i'm not even doing anything i'm just sharing with all of you information and um, it's it's incredible that just that in of itself is so powerful. Um, it's 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 really phenomenal. My question or I guess topic is how would gender fluid navigate transition, specifically medical transition? How would we know if it's a good thing for us? Asking as a gender fluid person. So this is a very big, very important question because for somebody who is gender fluid or even non-binary identified individuals, um, how to navigate especially medical transition, whether it is hormones or surgery, right? Because when you're gender fluid, uh, especially, uh, you have that fluidity to your gender identity. Your gender can easily oscillate between uh, amongst the spectrum easily, and you can land any of the spectrum at any given time. For that reason, transition can become difficult and dealing with dysphoria can become difficult because just like your gender fluidity can oscillate, your gender dysphoria is also going to oscillate with it. Meaning that sometimes if you feel, for example, uh, more of one gender identity than the other, um, but when you go out there, you get misgendered, that's going to increase gender dysphoria. So it's going to make things a little bit difficult because when your dysphoria goes up, you start questioning, oh, well, maybe I need medical intervention or surgical intervention in order to bring myself more in alignment. But what is the alignment we're talking about? Because the fluidity is a person that is very fluid. What I'm also thinking about is um, um, individuals who are able to shape shift, shapeshifters, um, shapeshifters who are able to morph and shift into different type of um, uh, individuals or a different type of, either, you know, in um, occultism, there's people who can shapeshift into animals. Uh, of course, I'm not saying you're shapeshifting into animal, but what I'm saying is that your fluidity to your to gender allows you to uh, feel more congruency towards one end of a spectrum one day and somewhere towards the middle the other day and somewhere towards the other end of a spectrum another day. You have that flexibility and it becomes very challenging again to figure out uh, what medical intervention you need because one day you may feel like you need this intervention, the next day you may feel like you don't and that's what also adds confusion to the mix. That's also what adds um, additional things in terms of making the decision. I don't have a straight answer. Um, in working with individuals who are non-binary and gender fluid and figuring out which surgical or medical intervention to go for, it was more of really um, sitting down and really figuring out in what way particular intervention is going to benefit you. In what way, for example, hormones are going to benefit you. Is it going to give you this? Will it take away this? Will it be worse giving this and taking away this? Or would it offset things? It's really more about uh, understanding what you may be getting or uh, what you may be also uh, detracting as a result of getting into interventions. Um, and you know, a lot of times with our genders, our gender identity for special individuals who are so fluid, things change all the time. Um, and you have to also be okay with this. You also have to be, uh, you have to understand that if you are going to have any services that are especially irreversible, you have to understand that you have to um, recognize it down the road. Things may change in terms of how you feel about those things. And you have to be more flexible and okay with it. I find it that people who are more um, 
who are less prone to anxiety, people who are less rigid mind thinking, people who are more easily um, easier to or quicker to adapt to changes and challenges in their life uh, and identify as gender fluid tend to make these decisions and be okay with decisions because all of those personality uh, traits that I just described, being able to adapt quickly to challenges and changes helps them tremendously down the road if it doesn't pan out for them. But unfortunately, you know, I wish I could have like a very clear answer, um, but it's really not. And, and it's sometimes, um, a challenge in, in the findings that middle ground what services you need and to what extent and a lot of it depends on, on what your needs are and sometimes you yourself just gonna have to make the decision and um yeah not an easy one i apologize i wish i had more uh this is what i recommend but you know your gender identity is not static and i think that's in of itself is a beautiful thing maybe even asking yourself whether you need medical or surgical at all giving the fluidity of your gender so that's what i would say to that great question all right. And last question for today is, is it true that it is easier for a cis male to schedule and receive an orchiectomy? Approved faster, less hoops for to jump through, etc., etc. counseling, insurance coverage, and such. Added. This person added it, obviously. I feel like this would be the right step for myself for many reasons, mainly because of steady increasing discomfort between my legs, but I also wonder if the skin would be better left alone for now in the event I decide on vaginoplasty later in life. So, okay, first of all, it's semi-medical question. Keep in mind, I'm not a medical doctor, but I will be able to answer to you what I have seen um, my clients do in this kind of situation. So one, it is okay, and I have seen a lot of people do orchiectomy before they consider on vaginoplasty. And if you are considering vaginoplasty down the road, you do want to consult with a potential vaginoplasty doctor to uh, make sure that they do want that skin preserved, depending on type of vaginoplasty you're going to get. Keep in mind, there are various types of vaginoplasties. And also what you do want to do is you want to talk to the doctor who is going to do orchiectomy and make sure that they also aware that they want to preserve that skin. Now, is it easier to schedule and receive an orchiectomy? That depends on the state you live in and what the state requirements are and what insurance you have. Um, I can't say if it's easier to schedule and get it approved faster because it still goes through the same WPASS criteria. Uh, WPASS 8th edition has been published, but insurances have yet not picked up on them. So a lot of insurances still need the same criteria. Two letters of evaluation. Uh, from mental health providers. One of them has to be a PhD level provider in order to get your approved orchiectomy. And you have to be at least a year on hormones prior to getting orchiectomy, unless hormones have been, uh, uh, you know, not really in, not good for you for your health or whatnot, or it's your choice not to be on hormones. But insurances are very anal about that one year on hormone marks. And even if a letter says that the person doesn't want to be on hormones, they will push for that because, again, they're creating criteria in order to uh, create all of these barriers for you, unfortunately. So I can't say that it's easier or not easier to receive orchiectomy. It really depends where you're at. Is it faster to get approved through? What's fast to think about ORCI is that um, uh, where vaginoplasty is a longer and more complicated procedure and a really good doctors are booked year to years in advance. Orchiectomy is something that a lot of doctors are able to perform. A lot of urologists do orchiectomies. So for that reason, it is a procedure faster in a sense. It is quicker to schedule it and uh, it's quicker for you to get that uh, completed. Versus for vaginoplasty, you maybe there might be a wait period. The recovery period is also a pretty quick for orchiectomy. Um, one thing you got to keep in mind, I know that you mentioned that um, you would like uh, you to eliminate the discomfort between your legs. My clients report that when they get got an uh, orchiectomy and they still uh, retain the skin because they planted on vaginoplasty down the road, they reported that it's not like that the testicle skin is completely uh, something that you don't feel. They still feel like they have something between their legs, but it definitely, definitely made tacking for those who are interested in tacking much more uh, comfortable for them uh, and less painful. So that's definitely a benefit, uh, but don't expect that things are completely going to be flatter. Is that what I'm trying to say? Um, but yeah, other than that, um, for people who... Um, 
do you want to stop uh, testosterone uh, blockers, either spiro or biclutamine or lipron, uh, getting uh, orchiectomy if down the road they do want to get vaginoplasty is a great option. Um, again, depending on the state where you're at, what the requirements are going to be, that's going to determine whether it is easier to get approval for or faster to get approval. But once you get the approval in terms of scheduling it, it doesn't take that long. Um, so that's what I got to say, but definitely consult with your doctor. Make sure they know that you do plan to get vaginoplasty down the road so they know uh, uh, to preserve the skin. Great question. Uh, so that's it for today. Those are five questions that I randomly picked for today. I will um, do more questions because I have a lot of more questions. A lot of you have been directly emailing me, which is fantastic. And so I will re keep releasing these videos every Monday. Uh, comment below. Leave any of the questions you have directly for me to answer in this Q&A. Um, share any kind of feedback you have about this video, share any kind of feedback about the content we discuss, any feedback you have for anybody else. I love reading all of your comments and I will see you all next time. Bye.